Hey everybody, it's Mitch Adams here, one of the co-founders of Ozo. You've probably heard the name or maybe even used our services. We are payment gateway based in South Africa and currently expanding into Africa. Now, we've gained a lot of uh, public recognition. A lot of people have seen the name now of the company and they're asking, where did this company come from? It just appear from nowhere. <laughs> no, not true. We didn't come from nowhere. Uh, it's been a slog. We've been going at this since 2014, so that's seven years now. And uh, yeah, in that seven year story to get to the success that we've gotten to at this point, that, that there's a story to tell, there's a, there's a proper story to tell. And uh, nobody really tells the story more in depth than me. I am chief storyteller of the tribe. Um, sometimes get a bit too in depth. I mean, I'll give you the character building, the motivation why somebody made a decision or said something so you can understand and there's no questions. So, uh, you know, people meet people at the pry and, and they're like, oh, so, uh, that's amazing. Oh, where, why, what? You know, tell me. And I'll tell them and it will be four hours later and uh, it still won't be done. So we'll have to reconvene at the next bride. And uh, I'll give you the previous video on Ozo and uh, carry on with the story. And then we'll probably have to go into another four hour session. Um, and look, as much as I love to tell stories and, uh, and go to prize, <laughs> It can get tedious having to tell each and every person you meet the story over and over and over, which is why I'm quite excited to share with you the documentary about Russia. But before you get to Russia, I just want to lay down some context on how the documentary came to be. So it starts with a guy called Tim Balan. He is a freelance videographer, amongst other things, but I know him as a freelance uh, videographer. Uh, he has his own company called Skylaholic and um, yeah the first time I met him I don't know who hired him or invited him over but we needed we just moved into our new offices in Melrose Arch it was I think 2018 and he came there to shoot a video for our recruitment yeah so there's a recruitment video we wanted something quite funky uh, quirky you know, showing the, the environment, what type of environment we, we work in, you know, guys are doing push-ups, juggling fruit, jumping off stuff, having races, you know, just showing the, the environment in the office, which, which is quite fun. Um, after that, he, he helped us with another video, uh, which was a submission to an incubator somewhere in Africa, and we decided to go to the wilds here in Joburg. If you go to the highest point there, you have this nice skyline of Johannesburg in the background. We did the video there. The video came out quite good, but what I do remember from that day is running away from the security guards because they were chasing us for a permit to shoot. Um, anyways, we, I mean, we got to shoot the video anyways, and we got away after that. Um, and then in 2019, end of 2019, we got nominated uh, for the best SME at the National Business Awards. The National Business Awards, yeah. Uh, so the National Business Awards gets run by a company called Topco Media. And uh, yeah, we got nominated for that. Myself and my wife went to that dinner that evening, uh, just before I went up. Oh, so I'm giving it away, we won. <laughs> so we won the, the SME of the year in 2019 at the National Business Awards. Uh, but just before I went up to go collect my award, Visa was there collecting their award, and then we went. I mean, they like payment giants, and here we're coming on like payment Davis, I guess. Uh, and as I'm walking up, Leah Malas was still the host there. I remember that night. She was the MC of, of, of the, the awards evening. I'm busy walking up to go collect my, the award for the company and to do a little speechy thing and there's this guy like screaming my name Mesh, Mesh, holding a camera in his hand there taking pictures I'm like who is this guy why is he going on like this and I see it's Tim so Tim was the official videographer there there were many other cameras around but he was the guy that was taking the pictures of the people going to get their award and smiling and he was just so happy and excited to see me um, I think because he's been part of that journey, you know, he saw us in 2018 or it might even be before that, it might have been 2017. But yeah, now we're in the uh, end of 2019 and we're busy winning this award coming up uh, just after Visa, you know. And uh, yeah, I could see the excitement in, in, 
in his place, see where we came and, and, and where we're going. Um, anyways, fast forward into 2020. Obviously, COVID has happened uh, and the company, I mean, we were well positioned to be successful during the COVID period uh, because of our online and digital presence. He really wanted, or he being them, really wanted to tell stories of small businesses that not only have done well through normal circumstances, but even more so during this trying period uh, of the pandemic. So he got in contact with Top Go Media to say, look, you guys had this award ceremony. There were a bunch of small companies there. You know, who can we speak to, to, to do some sort of, tell their story, you know? I mean, because these guys don't just come from nowhere. They, they, they're fighting the good fight here. And uh, obviously because we won the award and, and we have history, uh, with them, he was like, I, I wanna, I wanna tell Ozo's story. I mean, the, the, the one time I saw them, we were doing a recruitment video. Next thing, they're winning awards. So, I really wanna tell their story. So, yeah, they got in touch with us. They said, Yeah, we're gonna shoot this video. We're gonna put it together. And again, yeah, look, I had to tell a story. My business partners, Thomas Faze and Lyle Eckstein, had to tell their version of the story. Everybody gave their versions of the stories. And obviously mine took like, yeah, four hours or something. The other guys, probably not as long, but it was so long because it's a story. It's a story and a half. And it literally is only the story of the first two years that takes that long. Uh, the, I mean, we've gone on to do many other things. So it's from 2014 to 2016. 2014 is when we like started working together. It wasn't necessarily the company uh, that is today, Ozo. But we, we were just working together like think tank style. And uh, by 2016, we get our first investment and actually get to pay ourselves salaries. And from there, the company just grows from strength to strength to strength to strength and continues to do so. But those first two years is what this documentary is literally about. So it's a very small segment. And there's many other stories I can tell you. I mean, after 2016, there's so many hurdles we've overcome, so many other stories. Um, but uh, I guess he, he wanted to convey that first two years how difficult it is to actually get traction and get out there. So that was is what the, the story is about. Um, and we all yeah, gave our views. We were also asked to you know, bring anybody else that was involved in the story, you know, wives, friends, people that might have been uh, affected by it uh, because, you know, friendship wise maybe I was going through something I'm speaking something and Thomas is going through something he's speaking to somebody Lyle same thing and um, yeah so so we did that so it, it was a long process to do it this was in June 2020 and uh, yeah, we had that long session it took like a, basically half the day for him to interview all of us just to hear the story and then for him to figure out how he's going to position this thing how, what's he going to do cut out and all of that and then spent an entire day at my house interviewing me and all my witnesses <laughs> we call that uh, Lyle also with these witnesses Thomas was in Cape Town he had to fly down to Cape Town and shoot there with Thomas so it was quite a few days of shooting and then there was editing and you know, go into other locations also and just shoot in that. So it took some time. I think it was eventually complete at the end of 2020. Um, and it's it's been summarized into like 20 something minutes because we're looking at maybe putting it on TV. So you have to make space for adverts and all of that. So you're taking this four hour mini series type thing and, and you're shrinking it down you can't tell every single piece of the story and uh, I guess he also wanted to focus on specific things so he, he had full right on how everything should be structured what should be in what should be out so he cut out a lot of stuff left some things in but he felt told the story um, again if, if you have the discussion personally with me or personally with Lyle or Thomas you will 
hear more about the story and more elements involved in it as well but this gives you the gist of it this gives you a good summary of everything that happened there so now that you have the context um, watch it enjoy it <laughs> but if you do know me personally and you want to have more details invite me for a bride and set aside for hours for some story now back to your regularly scheduled program. South Africa is facing mass unemployment numbers and challenges on all fronts. Many feel the situation in South Africa is hopeless and many skilled professionals are seeking opportunities elsewhere. However, all is not lost as the government fights to uproot years of corruption and businesses rally together. The fight has just begun. Africa for many years has been behind in the tech revolution. However, many South Africans have played a pivotal role around the world and within South Africa. We are now on the cusp of a technological boom. But it is not easy doing business in South Africa and nothing comes without great hardship. Many South African stories go on being untold. This one will not. The day I first met Lyle, um, we had recently moved into a house in, in Flerov and uh, he was jumping over the wall of our yard because he lived at the back of our, our house. Not at the back of our house, his house was at the back of our house <laughs> in the street behind us. So he was using my yard, my father's yard as a shortcut to go to the house shop which is opposite my house. So uh, one day after Mitch had moved in, we jumped over the wall only to find him and his dad there. His dad basically said, this is, this is Mitch, you guys all play with him basically. And that's how we became friends. Remember at the age of 14, I started my first job. I was delivering pizza. Uh, it was in France, so underage. Um, but uh, that, was, that was a really cool experience, earning my really first uh, salary. I also got to start working over the weekend in my garage and fixing motorbike and scooters of all the students in my college. Um, that was another, that was probably the first business I started. Uh, Lyle, being the logical thinker, he went and studied a BSc uh, in computer science. So I just got into on to that and I figured, you know, let me also get into computer somewhat. Uh, I was fairly good at maths, so let me try it out. Just I can't learn from a book. I'm a bit more practical, so I went to technical to vet stick. That don't know me will say I'm a difficult person. People that know me will say Thomas knows exactly what he wants. And to me that that says a lot with regard to how Mitch and I got together. I had worked with Mitch in the past. The standard of excellence that uh, he worked at is something that I could associate with and we were very like-minded. So came across the opportunity of launching a new venture and, and needed the developers to basically assist and join us with this. And immediately thought about calling in. And uh, I think it was a timing and opportunity. It was at a stage in his life where um, he, had, he had not found happiness. Um, and there was a great opportunity. He knew about me, he knew about our past success, he knew about the relationships that we had in his past company. And for him it was about probably taking a leap of faith and seeing, you know, how, what could we do together? What sort of uh, greatness and success could we build together, if any? And that's how basically the story started with Mitch and I initially. I remember the phone call, um, I was at work and uh, he called me to say Thomas um, has this great idea and this is what they want to do. Um, but I say that uh, I didn't want him to resent me um, if this thing did work out. Um, and I thought I say to him that if he feels like it's something worthwhile and if it's something, if it's something that it's going to work then he should go for it. Uh, when I met Thomas, um, I immediately knew that this was his, his part, you know, just everything, all my interaction and engagement with him was all about being the future and, and delving into the future. So I guess for me, um, it became part of life um, and I became the wife of an entrepreneur 
um, the one that had to stand by him and, and not just stand by him or by his side or, or behind him, you know, but in fact join him. So just um, becoming his partner. So I met him for coffee uh, the following day and um, I mean he came with his normal charm and his you know successful order around him. So he just explained to me how in all his ventures that he's gone through he's always had to outsource developers and he found it very difficult. Uh, those guys kind of held him at ransom because he had to pay the money before he could get anything new done. But he figured if he had a partner walking with him that had that technical abilities um, then, then it would make sense and this whole time he had owned 100% of all the shares and paying off people on the side and he figured he'll let it, he'll share in the equity this time therefore I'll be more vested from a technical perspective and, and therefore he'll get more out of me and the product will get more out of both of us. We had a disgruntled competitor, which was ultimately uh, Mitch's old boss uh, at the time. Um, Mitch was under uh, NDA and restraint. Um, and as such, the competitor went and decided to uh, initiate a court case to try to stop us from what I would say is the ambition that we had in, in shaping the future of payment like it should be. As, as we learned a bit more about how these types of cases work, I mean, we, we learned that judges and stuff don't know all of these technical details, so it, it would basically almost be like a toss of a coin whether we would basically have to close the business or not. So when the court case came up, we were already overwhelmed. And for me, it was extremely, provoked a lot of anxiety, a lot of um, physical sicknesses and stuff like that and for the amount that it that it was it was ridiculous like we we didn't know how we were gonna pay it off we didn't have any assets to sell we were panicking we really were panicking. The way we took it initially is if we want to build such a big success across Africa with the ambition that we have of growing a global business in the next five to ten years we need to start getting training and getting accustomed to people suing us. Very frustrating, uh, it plays on your conscience, it gives you anxiety, and what, what's the repercussions of this? I mean, at that point I was very anxious, uh, very stressed, uh, concerned about going to jail, concerned that I had to pay back money, I already had this massive debt issue. How was I gonna even, you know, get this, this, this would ruin me. Yeah, I think, um, so what kept me going while, while Mitch was gone and it was just Thomas and I, um, basically there was a lot of commitment that, that Thomas had put in, he showed a lot of faith, so he, he basically committed to this thing, he sacrificed some stuff as we all did, but I mean, I, I think we were already past the point of no return, like I, I'm not someone that accepts failure easily, uh, I don't think either Mitch or Thomas are as well, so there was definitely no turning back. We, we were going to basically take it to the end, whether it was gonna succeed or not. Um, I always knew Mitch would come back, but I think the main reason that kept him away for the time that he, he was there is because the business couldn't afford for him to come back at that point as well. Look, so we bootstrapped the business for the first three years. Um, that meant basically taking money from our personal bank account, selling our cars, selling houses, selling our own personal asset, but also using pretty much the other businesses that we had to basically fund this business in any way, shape or form. If it meant being late on, on, on VAT payment or even my or Oreo's salary payment to make sure that everyone would get it, it was, it was what, what had to be made, you know. We were committed to a vision. We knew that if it took five or ten years, we would end up getting there. For me, I think what was a lot easier compared to Mitch and Lyle is the fact that it wasn't my first business. So I understood that as much as you can be in that tunnel and you might not be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, I knew that by continuing on, on, on that road uh, 
and, and, and with the grit, I will end up basically seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. When they got the news and Mitch had to, um, basically, they had to terminate him or whatever it was, like effective immediately, I was quite disappointed because um, it just meant that now there would be like an extra amount of pressure put on Lau because at then, basically, he was the only, only developer working on iPay for the entire time that Mitchin couldn't work um, or have anything to do with iPay. So uh, it was really intense. Um, he was stressed out like, I mean, we, we hardly saw each other. Like he would leave for work before I got up in the morning and he would come home like at 11 o'clock at night. Like, and that was most nice. Like we had no family life whatsoever. Being my best friend, he was still in that pit of despair <laughs> that I left him in. Uh, and I'm like, I brought him into this, I need to get him out. Uh, also what he said to me is, this couldn't have been for nothing, we need to try this. So um, I started working, call it moonlighting on it a bit, getting back into it. The code had changed a bit because Lyle and Thomas had been running uh, the system in the background on their own and some money had gone through it. Uh, and we were working on a deal with a big uh, payments company for them to distribute it. So my kind of middle ground was I'll come back as long as that deal gets uh, finalized and once it's finalized I'll come back and I'll come back for six months. I never told uh, at least Thomas that I was gonna cut it at six months but I think I told Lyle. I definitely told my wife because that was the way that we agreed to do it. Uh, it definitely added strain on my wife. Um, I think she first believed in it, but after it takes a certain amount of time, people stop believing because, I mean, you can only tell them that next month the things are going to change or the following month things are going to change. But if it doesn't happen, like within that time, the more you say that, the less effective it is. So it definitely put a big strain on the relationship and as well as like friends and family, as I said before, were always saying like, why are you doing this? You can just get a job, provide for your family. You don't need to take this risk. By continuing on, on, on that road uh, and, and, and with the grit, I will end up basically seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. And when we started basically going through the process of raising capital, it was about how can we basically find someone that's going to add credibility and authority for startup companies that literally is getting involved in bank-to-bank -bank payment, where trust is about everything. It was very interesting because we got about four final investors that all wanted to, uh, to uh, uh, put money into the business. I think like he was starting to get to the point where he was getting a bit despondent because he just felt like it was taking so long and every time um, they had gotten to the point where okay this is gonna happen now and he'd come home and be like babe like by next month like definitely definitely and then it would come and go and he was starting to get so discouraged. Um, and I remember this process, which is always one that drags on, and there's more questions, and there's one last meeting, and for me it was absolutely normal, it's part of negotiation, it's part of the cycle that you go through. But I remember for everyone else, it was like, this is never happening, you keep on saying it's gonna happen, and um, you know what they say, it's, it's lonely at the top, but you have to keep that grit, you have to keep that perseverance. I phoned my wife, it was on our anniversary, in 2016 and I phoned her to say hey we've just signed a deal for 10 million rand um, which was our first angel investment we didn't get the money yet we just had signed the deal and my wife said congratulations they just got our electricity but I knew at that point that would be the last time our electricity got cut. I remember literally being in Cape Town funny enough in the place that's a hundred meters away from here and meeting with those investors committing verbally to it and celebrating with a crazy dance at the time that I think my wife recorded uh, and sharing that video with, with Mitch and Lyle about, about, about that big win for us. It was the first time we had ever raised money. We ended up raising 10 million right at the time, which obviously is a significant uh, budget. Um, and it was, I think it was a big sense of relief, which is, it's okay now. We're on the right track. I can remember Mitch saying to me, 
he phoned me one night and he said to me, look dude, um, some good things have come through for me right now and I could actually see in the conversation that we had that night and I, I'm thinking back on that night and him just being the man that he is still now. From his success then, he's constantly just been a blessing because when he phoned me that night, it was a matter of he wanted to, because he now made it through his big area in his life, he wanted to sow into other people's lives. And I was one of those people that he actually sowed into. And I can remember that, that night and the phone call very clearly. And I could hear in his emotions that he was in a good place and he was happy. And I could hear in his voice that he was, he got the breakthrough that he was expecting and he's, he's happy and he's, he's seen that the test of everything that he's gone through has actually just paid off. And I can remember the conversation and he said to me, the test is not, the test is the part of the testimony. And that was the beginning of Ozone. Okay, so after all of these years and looking back and seeing how Mitchin has developed as a, a son, as a father, and as a husband as well. You know, as a mother, I am so proud to say that that is my son. I always encourage him to take risks, and uh, and then when he takes the risks, I, uh, you know, he, he does make you a little bit nervous. But uh, as I said, we always said that where you're going to fall to when you fall, there's always a place to fall to, and if and that place is in your in your family and and the people who are backing you. And then I met Thomas at the bar um, through a friend who told me to come join him there. And then I went there, met this guy, had a drink with him. I offered to buy him a drink and Thomas said, I'll buy you a suitcase. Um, then he bought me an actual suitcase set of shots. We downed them all, carried on speaking French, just getting to know each other. Um, and he asked me if I could sell him the bottle of gin um, at the bar, behind the barman. And I was like, um, yeah, for sure. And I basically sold him the bottle of gin right then and there. I actually remember that pitch in my head even. And Thomas was just so amazed. He looked at me and he said, um, I really, really like you. And then throughout the night later on, Emmanuel, who is our chief of staff at the moment, um, came and gave me his business card and basically said, uh, we really want you to come work with us. Fintechs were becoming the new hot item and I'd heard about this amazing upcoming fintech. Um, a friend of mine told me they were looking for a head of legal, um, so I basically shot my shot. <laughs> I um, sent through my CV and I met the CEO and one of the co-founders, Thomas Pays. I'll always remember just how refreshing the meeting was. It was so exciting to hear the passion in his voice, understand where they were going, and it just seemed like the right type of challenge for me um, at this point in t at that point in time in my career. So the problem, the, the, the big problem that we solve in South Africa is we, we bridge the financial gap um, that exists within the financial instruments in South Africa. For example, um, if you think about uh, the world's largest e-hailing company, um, where one of the requirements is the consumer needs to have a credit card to tokenize in order to use that app. So what Ozo does is in order to close that gap, we enable any customers with a bank account in South Africa to transact with that e-hailing company with a matter of seconds, um, without any cards or cash. And for the merchant, the biggest thing is we save them money from day one. You know, not only are we, are we a market leader um, today in South Africa in terms of what we do, but I actually see Ozo becoming a global market leader um, in terms of what we do in the next uh, three to five years. Um, I see the business growing significantly. We want the brand to be synonymous with payments across, across the globe um, eventually, you know, initially across Africa and then across the globe. With regards to the future, I definitely see myself sticking around for quite a long time. I think we're all on a mission here at Ozo to build Africa's next unicorn and I'm really keen to be a part of that journey and kind of keen to reach that milestone with the team. Because if there's one, sir, one thing that we, we're sure about is that uh, the support that we get from our consumer, from our merchant, is one that is growing so quickly uh, and creating such a big snowball effect that it's not a momentum that you'll be able to stop over the next 10 to 20 years.